Hello, I'd like to thank the organizers to let me the opportunity to talk today. I'm going to address a long-standing question in speciational research, which is can we distinguish between primary and secondary intergradation? Uh, there are many recent papers that uh, argue that when the environment is new or and patchy, one can find evidence for ongoing primary differentiation. And I have uh, 10 hours to explain that it's, uh, it can be more complex based on the work I did with my co-author, Pierre-Alexandre Gagnère and uh, Patrice David in this beautiful lab near the Tolago. Okay, so what are the two scenarios we would like to confront? In the secondary intergradation scenario, an ancestral population has split into two geographically isolated populations that have diverged in allopatry and has come back into contact and now exchange genes. In the primary intergradation model, divergence has taken place between adjacent populations in the face of gene flow. Of course, it is too extreme of a gradient of gene flow during uh, speciation. You can even argue that secondary contact is a special case of speciation with gene flow, but they are nonetheless uh, useful to confront because they oppose two different mindsets in speciation research, one in which reproductive barriers are thought to accumulate slowly and to be mainly intrinsic, and one in which reproductive barriers accumulate quickly and are thought to be mainly ecological. And we cannot say that warnings do not exist. To caution that secondary and primary intergradation are really difficult to distinguish, in his 1977 book, Endler concluded, because primary and secondary intergradation produce the same kinds of geographical phenomena and can evolve in the same order of magnitude of time, it will be impossible to distinguish between primary and secondary intergradation. In the seminar review on hybridisms, Barton and Hewitt concluded, much attention has therefore been focused on whether hybrid zones were established through primary or secondary contact. However, this question is hard to answer and, in any case, may not tell us about the origin of genetic divergence. If hybrid zones are indeed ancient and in a stable equilibrium, all traces of their origin may have been lost. All traces of their origin may have been lost. <laughs> So let me illustrate the case with a simple model, a single time hybrid zone. I simulate a standard static stone model with three loci, a selected locus under local selection in blue, a neutral locus linked to the selected locus in green, and a neutral locus unlinked to the selected locus in red. All the subpopulations on the left half side of the stepping stone are habitat one, and all the subpopulations on the half right side of the spring stone are habitat 2. Only the initial conditions differ between the two models. In the secondary contact model, all the subpopulations on the left are fixed for one allele and all the populations on the right are fixed for the alternative allele at the three loci. So the differentiation of the genome is initially uh, very hard. And in the primary differentiation model, the, poly the neutral locus is polymorphic with uh, high frequencies in 50-50 uh, in every subpopulation. And the selective locus is fixed for one allele, the habitat 2 allele. And the, the allele favored in habitat 1 appears by mutation. Initially, the differentiation of the genome is homogeneously low. After short transition phases, short in first approximation and matter of debate, for question. Uh, the two models converge to very similar geographic and genomic patterns. We obtain two parapatric forms isolated by a hybrid zone that function as a semi-permeable barrier to gene flow. So one situation in which uh, primary differentiation is favored over secondary contact is when uh, reproductive isolation is found between two habitats, one of which is known to be new. This is the case if 
For example, in phytofibrosing cells, uh, when we know that uh, one host plant has been introduced recently uh, through human activities, this is also the case in fishes that have colonized lakes and rivers formed as glaciation retreated. Let me take uh, an example, the Baltic Sea. Uh, we know that marine transgression in the Baltic Sea happened 8,000 years ago. So colonization by marine taxa cannot be older than 8,000 years. And uh, the entrance of the Baltic Sea is now recognized as a hotspot of genetic differentiation on all these species which is attributed to incipient local adaptation to brackish water. However, there are some uh, systems where the hybrid zone at the entrance of the Baltic Sea uh, is between species that have diverged for several million years. In mussels, for example, or in the Telinid of the the diversion time is known to be three and a half million years. So far more than 8,000 years. So how can we explain this? One possibility is that a new local adaptation can, could have trapped an old tension zone. Imagine there is a tension zone somewhere in the North Sea, maintained by intrinsic uh, genetic incompatibilities, and the marine transgression happens, a new adaptation appears and spread. Then, coupling operate between the tension zone and the exogenous line. The tension zone, if it is purely intrinsic, can move, while the exogenous line can't move. It is uh, stabilized at the environmental boundary. So the tension zone is going to be attracted by the exogenous line, and the two clines will coincide uh, at the environmental boundary. The hybrid zone, the position of the hybrid zone is new, but most of the barrier loci are old. If the barrier is strong, uh, the differentiation will be visible at most of the genome, for example in muscle or macoma, where the the barrier is very strong, but if the barrier is more porous, uh, the differentiation will only be visible on genomic islands that resist infrogression. Another situation uh, where the, uh, the primary differentiation model is preferred is when the environment is patchy, and uh, the differentiation at selected loci correlates with the environment, while the differentiation at neutral markers correlates with geographic connectivity. It is illustrated here with population trees, where selected loci regroup populations according to the habitat, while neutral markers regroup populations according to distance. There are many examples here in Litorina Winkles in Galicia, these authors to the three populations and the neutral markers show a clear geographic structure between the northern population and the two southern population, while uh, selected loci regroup population according to the habitat. And it is the same discordant pattern has been observed in all these uh, case studies. So let's verify that this conflictual pattern between neutral and selected markers is not expected under subliminal contact. I use the same model as previously, but this time the environment is patchy. Uh, the habitat status is randomly attributed uh, to each subpopulation at the beginning of the simulation. And again, after short transition phases, short here means far shorter than in the single time model, both scenarios converge to a very similar geographic and genomic pattern. Uh, the um, ecotypes colonize the two habitats to which they are adapted, <coughs> while neutral markers self-organized are according to geography. And uh, a semi-permeable barrier 
uh, as a lace <coughs> and two uh, echo ties. So what? First, we should accept that neutron markers can sometimes be amnesic. And when the case, that sophisticated Bayesian method will not make them the memory back. Uh, this is not a pessimistic message. We have to be aware of what we can do and can do with molecular markers. Second, the story of speciation should ideally be reconstructed with selected loci or neutral loci linked to them. This is becoming increasingly easy in the case of genomics. So just do not only ask the number, size, and shape of genomic islands. Please also ask their age. Do not trust the mitochondrial DNA studied 20 years ago. Revise your hypothesis. And actually, in the few cases where this is done, the divergence is often older than initially thought, predating the last glacial oscillation. So I will finish with an example. Uh, Roger explained it briefly. I try to explain it in more details. So it's the, the example of marine and freshwater sticklebacks. The marine ecotype was thought the ancestral form to all freshwater populations that would have repeatedly adapted to streams after glaciation retreats. So parallel adaptive uh, uh, speciation. But when uh, selected loci have been found, the divergence proved to be far older than 10,000 years. The divergence between the two islands of Ida is 2 million years. 64 regions of very small divergence, probably far older than 10,000 years, have been found between marine and freshwater genomes. So to reconcile this observation and the initial hypothesis that adaptation to strings in itself is uh, recent, uh, it has been proposed that adaptation from standing genetic variation explains the recent adaptation. But what does this mean exactly? We can imagine at least three scenarios. First, the stream ecotypes have dis totally disappeared during, during the last glacial cycle, <coughs> but freshwater adapted alleles have survived as standing genetic variation within the marine genome, allowing uh, adaptation <coughs> to streams when the glacier has uh, retreated. Um, so it is one scenario. Another possible scenario is that the stream ecotype has survived the glacial cycle has colonized northern streams by following the glacier meltwater uh, during glaciation retreats, and uh, the marine population has closed the, um, each river, uh, forming a hybrid zone at the entrance of each river. In this model, um, the marine allele would have swamped, totally swamped the stream genomes at uh, genome region unlinked to selected loci, while the remnant of the initial differentiation between marine and stream populations is only visible in genomic islands that have resisted in progression. An alternative scenario is that uh, Freshwater adaptive alleles allow the colonization of northern streams by temporarily introducing the marine genome. Of these three scenarios, only the first one can be used as an argument for ongoing uh, ecological speciation, while the other two are in effect secondary contact between anciently diverged backgrounds. As at the end they all converge to exactly the same geographical and uh, genomic pattern, it is impossible to know which one is uh, true. So we can not favor one over the other. Uh, so I thank you for your attention. <laughs> Okay, there's time for one or two questions. Okay. So there is no solution to this problem? <laughs>
probably, well, um, we can uh, try to find solution. Uh, I would say uh, that um, if you can have the edge of a uh, genomic island, in this scenario, uh, there is no reason for the coalescence to be exactly the same. For example, every island would be 2 million years old. While in this scenario, you expect uh, genomic islands to have the same age. But unfortunately, if you had uh, several contacts uh, at each interglacial, even in this scenario, you can have a strata of divergence. So it's going to be difficult. But, uh, the other solution is to know the the genetic determinism of isolation factor, if you have ecological and intrinsic factor. In this case, you expect uh, a preponderance of uh, ecological uh, polymorphism, while in this case, you can maintain intrinsic uh, incompatibilities more easily. Because here, you do not expect uh, intrinsic incompatibilities to, uh, to follow the freshwater adapted islands that are blocked in the, in the refuge. Only in this case, and it can be difficult, can uh, intrinsic incompatibilities be maintained because of the initial condition. But nonetheless, it is very difficult. Okay, I think we have to move on.